So, I think it's turn day two. Um, Tom May. And the, the introduction is going to be short for this conference, as I said yesterday. It's going to be a short one. <laughs> Todd's got a substantial body of work. Those of you who have been in his classes uh, will know. I mean, I mean yeah, you know, this, this is, he's just finished a book on friendship, and this is going to be part of that, um, that project. Um, and Todd's produced a substantial body of work over the years, which I won't go into. I want to talk about just, just quickly a couple of things. Firstly, he is, as, um, as, I mean, being a chair is like being an abbot in a monastery. You just get responsibility without power. Um, but you know, you, you know, the, well, the nice thing you can get people to come in. But uh, I'm very pleased that Todd was here this semester and it was incredibly easy to deal with, unlike some people. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and he would have slept on the floor in this room and taught classes here. You know, and, 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 uh, and, uh, from New York, uh, back in New York, um, and uh, I've seen uh, on Wednesday evenings after the prospective seminar in Spain, Todd turns up with the Foucault students who are enraptured, enlivened, and talking. And Todd's pedagogical technique leaves me breathless in terms of that, the risks that he takes and the ability to um, present this material in an incredibly interesting way. There's been enormous excitement around the course on Foucault, and I just want to thank you really for being here this semester. <laughs> Because they can involve affections that are not able to be monitored or channeled 
by policing of contemporary social relationships are somehow threatening the social order. Foucault's suggestion is one that deserves to be pursued, even more so, as I will argue, in the period of neoliberalism. However, its pursuit is not limited to homosexual friendship. So, while Foucault's suggestion about friendship as resistance is one theoretical source of this paper, another source lies in the thought of Jacques Rancière. Although a longer explanation of the role of this source will emerge later in the discussion, let me gloss it quickly at the outset. For Rancière, a true democratic politics is one that emerges from the presupposition of the equality of anyone and everyone. Such a presupposition runs counter to prevailing social arrangements, indeed to almost any social arrangements in human history. Rancière does not detail the internal character or texture of such democratic movements, except to note that they are based on a certain trust. He writes, quote, the test of democracy must ever be in democracy's own image, personal, sporadic, and founded on trust, end quote. The final motivation for the paper comes from my classes in philosophy, and specifically, my classes in Marxist and anarchist theory. Often, my students find the arguments of these philosophers at least interesting and sometimes compelling. But they offer a common complaint. Anarchism and Marxism, they say, are unrealistic. People would never cooperate in the ways these views require. Marxism, um, Marxism and anarchism are, in the end, naive. In response, I have often resorted to the example of friendship. I tell them that we think of ourselves and our friends as more or less equals. We would never seriously consider exploiting our friends. And we don't generally see our friendships, at least the best among them, as subject to the economy of credit and debt. Moreover, these friendships are among the most meaningful aspects of our lives. Why, then, I ask them, is it the thought that we cannot take some of the elements of our most significant relationships and extend them into the political and economic arena? These three sources converge on the idea that friendship, at least some types of friendship, might have a political impact. It is that idea I want to develop here. Before embarking on it, though, let me say a little bit about what I don't want to do. I don't want to claim that all friendships are politically resistant. I would prefer that people not say to themselves at the end of the paper, hey, I can be a revolutionary. Let me just go out and make a new friend. <laughs> In academics, there is much posturing that believes itself to pass for political resistance. My goal here is not to add an item to that particular inventory. Nor do I want to isolate the essence of friendship itself. I will use the definition of friendship, one postulated by Elizabeth Telfer. Moreover, I will offer intersections of my discussion with Adam's classic views of friendship, right, most particularly at Aristotle. But I'm not interested here in the particular character or essence of friendship itself. As the sociologist Liz Spencer and Ray Pollock sought to show, contra Putnam's argument in Bowling Alone that people have become increasingly disconnected from one another, they show that there are a variety of types of relationships, both formal and informal, in contemporary society. And many of them are considered by their participants to be forms of friendship. They write, quote, the more we explore in detail the range and quality of people's actual rather than imputed social relationships, the more the intricacy of their micro-social worlds and the hidden solidarities they contain are revealed." What I'm interested in, instead, is the political possibilities of some types of friendships. Moreover, I'm interested in them not as a matter of political resistance generally, but as a matter of political resistance to a particular dominant strain of our social, political, and economic culture, one that I will call neoliberalism. I will proceed in three stages. First, I will discuss the character of neoliberalism, particularly as it appears to frame our social relationships. There, I will make a distinction that often goes missing in the discussion of neoliberalism. Second, I will briefly canvass the character of friendship and look to isolate elements of friendship that resist the way in which neoliberalism itself frames social relationships. Finally, I will try to suggest why this type of friendship has political implications. That will bring the discussion back to Foucault and Ranciere, but I hope with more detail than they offer in their gestures in this direction. Neoliberalism is as much a movement as it is an economic view. Considered as the latter, as a movement, it might be characterized as the view that endorses more or less unrestricted capitalism and open markets as the best economic system, not only nationally, but internationally. 
As David Harvey defines it, quote, a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can be best advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade, end quote. Considered as a movement, neoliberalism involves a particular set of interventions into various national markets. In particular, many of you are familiar with this, supported by the World Bank and especially the IMF. It has sought, at least very recently, to promulgate deregulation, privatization, and the withdrawal of the public sector from social services. There are any number of discussions one might have about the origins, purposes, and effects of neoliberalism. I would like here to concentrate on a particular aspect of its operation, the kinds of individuals or subjects neoliberalism seeks to create. In other words, recognizing that individuals are formed in particular social, economic, and political circumstances. I would like to focus on what kinds of individuals are created in a context dominated by neoliberalism. It is at this level, the formation of individuals in neoliberalism, that I see friendship offering the possibility for political resistance. In particular, there are two types of individuals, or better, two types of personal formations, or what Foucault sometimes calls figures, that are the product of neoliberals. We might designate them as the consumer and the entrepreneur. These two have been confused, but if we are to understand neoliberal subject formation precisely and correctly, it is worth keeping them distinct. The first, the consumer, has been discussed in depth by many thinkers. For instance, Benjamin Barber, Zygmunt Bauman, and from a slightly different angle, Jean Baudrillard. It is probably the figure we are most familiar with. The second, the entrepreneur, emerges in Foucault's late lectures, The Birth of Biopolitics. This figure is distinct from, but not contradictory to the consumer. In fact, many of us, in as much as we are products of neoliberals, are some combination or intersection of the two. The consumer is perhaps best summed up by the phrase, I shop, therefore I am. It is the person who defines himself or herself or what, by what they own, or more often by the activity of purchasing. As Baudrillard has emphasized in his critique of Marx and Marxism, many of us no longer define ourselves as producers. We do not ground our identity in what we create, but rather in what we own or in our buying. We identify ourselves as consumers. This identification was recognized at the turn of the 20th century by Thorsten Beblin, but has become much more central to our culture over the past several decades. This idea has been summed up by Bauman. He writes, quote, the society of consumers stands for the kind of society that promotes, encourages, or enforces the choice of a consumer's lifestyle and life strategy and dislikes all alternative cultural options. A society which adapting to the precepts of consumer culture and following them strictly is a condition of membership, I quote. The entrepreneur is the figure Foucault defines as more recent homo economics. Foucault writes that in contrast to the consumer view of neoliberalism, quote, not a society of the supermarket, a society of enterprise. Homo economicus is not the man of exchange, he is not the consuming man, he is the man of enterprise and production, end quote. The entrepreneur is the investor, the figure that seeks to place a part of his or her resources somewhere where it will yield the best return. In his lectures, Foucault refers to the American neoliberal and Nobel laureate, Gary Becker, <coughs> who saw the entrepreneurial figure as a standard for all aspects of personal life, not simply one's economic involvement. Parenthood, for instance, involves an investment of resources and creation of an individual. That investment, in turn, requires particular genetic resources, thus the importance of finding a 